All right. So the next speaker is uh, Italo Vignoli, uh, who will be talking about uh, education regarding uh, free and open source software ethics. Okay. Okay. So uh, the, the experience is related uh, to LibreOffice, uh, but we think that uh, can be applied to any kind of uh, uh, free and open source software, and especially to any kind of migration project from proprietary to open source software. Uh, so of course, uh, I will make references to LibreOffice, but uh, just consider that because my experience is based on that. It's not because I want you to consider this uh, as something which is strongly related only to LibreOffice. For instance, we have already done it for migrations of uh, Windows to Linux, and it works in the same way. So uh, when, uh, we, uh, when people think about deploying uh, free software on the desktop, uh, usually the first program that they, they don't see the browser as a problem. Uh, I would say there is already a majority of people look, uh, using a, a free browser uh, on, on, on their desktop. We have a large number of uh, Windows users using Firefox or Chrome or Chromium or Chrome, uh, which is proprietary, but they say as an as a, uh, open source brother. Uh, and uh, they, they see the major challenge when they move from the proprietary office suite to the uh, free office suite. That is where they have more problems because you have to deal with documents and you have to deal with uh, habits that are uh, strongly connected to your uh, work habits. Therefore, uh, uh, you don't see the same resistance to change when you migrate uh, emails, uh, although people will uh, 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 protest if they have to move from Outlook to other, uh, to other emails, uh, uh, but they are already used to use uh, uh, online email clients, so that is uh, reduced. The problem is really when you move from Microsoft Office to LibreOffice or to any other one, or you moved from uh, the, the entire operating system. Uh, and uh, there are questions that are asked uh, uh, which uh, do not like, uh, do not look like uh, good questions for anyone that is in, involved in open source, but they look natural for everyone that doesn't understand open source. So we, uh, being a member of the LibreOffice community, and doing a lot of trainings, especially in uh, public administration, we, we found ourselves uh, uh, facing the resistance to change. And uh, when you go deeply into this, uh, you realize that there, is, uh, there are studies about, the, about perception and psychology. The uh, Mrs. Kubler-Ross was a, a, Sw a Swiss psychologist that studied uh, the resistance to change. And uh, uh, actually, uh, the first study was uh, about uh, the death of a relative. But then she realized that we, the pattern that our mind develops is very similar for any kind of change. Of course, the death of a relative is a sudden change. But it looks like if you take away Microsoft Office and install LibreOffice to someone, it's like you kill a relative to many person. Uh, so uh, we, we get this kind of question, you know, if it's free, it can be good. The second one, if it's free and good, there must be a trick somewhere. Believe, uh, remember that I'm Italian, so in Italy, <laughs> people would say, ha ha, it's free and good, <laughs> there is some trick somewhere. How the hell you can develop a good free software? If it's free, developer can be professional, of course. If you can look into the code, what about security? A free software is creating issues to Microsoft and therefore to the software industry. Because Microsoft is the software industry. We have enough money to buy, mic sorry, to buy Microsoft licenses. So why we should migrate to a 
they, they, they see only the, the free as not money side of the, the, and the format is standard, but it's also incompatible. Okay, uh, so how do you, and, and these are coming, I can tell you, they, if they're not coming directly, they are in the eyes and in the mind of the people that you are talking to. So uh, after starting doing some project and seeing that the resistance to change was not changing, we decided to, as we say, in, in Italy we say prendere il toro per le corna, which means uh, you take the bull for, from the horns. So we, we really, we, we changed the paradigm and we took the bull from the horns. And so we have, uh, we have a, a training protocol for LibreOffice, so we added introduction to free software and introduction to LibreOffice as a free software before starting any kind of, uh, you know, feature competence. And, uh, you know, in, in Italy there is one of the largest migrations to, from Microsoft Office to LibreOffice is the Ministry of Defense. They're migrating 100,000 people, so which is quite big. Of course, we are not training all the 100,000 people, but we have trained the trainers. And uh, the, the Italian Association, uh, as uh, the members of the Italian Association, certi all certified uh, by TDF, uh, have trained the trainers. Uh, and uh, when we presented the syllabus, the syllabus was 36 hours, and the first four hours were Italo Vignoli will explain about free software. And, uh, so the, the, the general uh, called me and said, okay, uh, why we have to listen to you? Can we get rid of the four, free, uh, four hours? And I said, you know, these are a prerequisite for the next 32. So if you don't want to do the first four hour, we are not going to train anyone. Is that okay as a deal? He said, no, 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 it's not okay. So I, you know, in front of 60 people, all Microsoft Gold certified trainers. <laughs> you enter the room and you see the eyes that are at question mark shape. <laughs> they look at you and say, okay, so four hours in front of that boring old guy and uh, I don't know what he will tell us so interesting. And I start to say, first, LibreOffice is not developed by a company, but by a foundation, not for profit. So this is the first difference. You, you should consider that we don't pay developers. Developers are paid indirectly or directly by customers, by users, users of the software through donations, through uh, paying people to solve, uh, to, to develop feature, pay people to solve bugs pay people to do deployment on thousands of desktops and so on and so forth. So this is the first difference. We are not a company. We are a foundation. So first problem, there is not a phone number you can call to blame about anything. It's a foundation. We have a phone number, of course, be because the law tells us to have a phone number. There is a answering machine that says if you have a problem with the software, do not leave a message because <laughs> no, one, no one will call back. Of course, if you want to talk with, to someone at, the, at TDF, leave your coordinates, we will call back. But the, if it is because of the software, no way. And second thing, we, we have five basic principles. The first one, copyleft license. So if you do something for the software, you have to contribute it back to the community. It means you cannot do anything, even if, if, if you, you cannot have a specific feature which is just for you, the military. If we are happy to develop the feature, you can ask us, uh, just wait a couple of months before the feature has been tested, debugged to in a way that is solid, but after those two, three months, the feature will be in every version of LibreOffice for everyone. And, and, and they say, but then what's in there for me? 
It's in there that you are using features developed by the French government, developed by uh, the Taiwanese government, developed by companies that are paying the feature. So if you want to get the feature that are paid by others, you have to do exactly the same with the others. So you pay the feature, the feature will be some, something for everyone. We don't have a contributor agreement because we want to keep the barrier to entry very low. LibreOffice is a 7.5 million lines of code beast. That, uh, by the way, uh, at this point I usually say, uh, you think that it was developed as a clone of Microsoft Office. So if it is a clone of Microsoft Office, it would be the first example in history of a clone that was born one year before the, cl the, 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 the clone, because uh, uh, Marco Muller, who is the, 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 the original developer, uh, developed that one year before Microsoft started working at Microsoft Word for DOS 1.0. So it's not a clone, it was developed by a student in northern Germany who was a, a brilliant geek and was considering all the solutions at the moment n not as good as the one that he would develop for his own needs. So he, he was a real geek, he started developing a, a word processor to write his thesis for the high school in Germany. And this is history. So they say, oh, so it's not a clone. How the hell, you, why you develop? Because this is a human need. Producing documents is a human need. So the guy understood at the time that he, the, he, he, when he did the software, the software was so good that in Germany, uh, they got up to almost 40% of the market until Microsoft decided to halve the prices of their products, so they started to have problems because of competitive pressure uh, in a single market that of course was uh, not possible for a small company to stand. We have a community who's based on meritocracy, so uh, if you do things, uh, you are the one that manages also, although we don't like the word manager, leader, but the reality in, uh, let's say, in enterprise wording, you are the manager of a, or the leader of a project. Uh, so, don't call me and say, can you do that? Because I'm not, I'm no one, uh, although they recognize me as the leader, because I just, I'm older of the Italian community, but I have no words with developers, because developers know, I know developers, so I don't call developers and say, can you do this and that, because the developer will not listen to me. Uh, if they want, they do what I ask them, but if, they understand that I am asking this because I have an interest, which is, you know, some company interest behind that. They will not, they will not accept. There is a community governance and we are vendor independent. Uh, we have a 30% uh, uh, voting barrier in our uh, bodies. So no one uh, can have more than 30% of the votes in the board of director and in the membership committee. This because uh, we don't want to go back to the years as where Sun had a community, uh, a community council at uh, Open Office where there were three Sun employees and three uh, community members and uh, the, the community manager who was basically a Sun employee. So all voting was four against three and that was a completely unfortunate situation. And in addition, this is what we do. So to develop LibreOffice is the last one. First, we want to promote free software, software user freedom, document freedom, open standards. And then at the end, because of the first floor, the first four, we develop LibreOffice. And we have a community that spans the world. So don't consider Italy, in, in the case of these guys, don't consider Italy as unique. You know, we, we are everywhere, which you might find a, is an advantage or a disadvantage, but especially if you consider that there is an Italian that is everywhere, but that's the situation. Uh, and uh, we have three main differences with proprietary software. 
that is close innovation. So they say the smarter people work for, for us. We say the smarter people work with us. We protect our ideas. We share our ideas, which is exactly the opposite. And we leverage the few ideas because, of course, if you don't share the ideas, you, you have a few of them. And we leverage the many ideas that we have. Probably we don't use them all, but we share them because we know that only by sharing we have power, the power of the community. And then we do, of course, large organizations are worried about quality. So we do a lot of quality. And, and I explain the quality process. Of course, I'm not going into that, but you know, I showed this kind of, we grow the unit test and the guy that is coordinating this is a volunteer. So you cannot call Marcus Mora and say, Marcus, can you develop another five tests for 6.2? If he, if he wants, he does this. If he doesn't want it, that, he's not doing it. But the concept is that uh, ask Microsoft this chart how many tests they do. Uh, you, you won't get an answer because this is transparent. Of course, it's online. It's published. But if every, people look into your code, this is what we want because m more eyes look are on the code the lower chances that something up bad happens to the code. And in fact, we use, uh, and then, uh, of course, we do this, but we also leverage uh, services that are provided for free to free software. So we use Coverity Scan. Every week, uh, we do a scan of, uh, with Coverity. There are a huge number of false positives, but there is also a number of real problems that every week are introduced in, uh, in, uh, in our code. Luckily, the number is so low that our Coverity scan score is 0 .00 for the has been 0 0.00 for the last six years. So we have a, now, a, the current situation, we have three open problem, real ones, of over 7.5 million of lines of code, which is almost nothing. And of course, we use Google Fuzz. When Google uh, made this available, we started using it. And then uh, we look at interoperability. So we, we, we have a definition by the, the, the EU, which is a good one. We respect it. We, we, our file format is better because it's really a standard one. And uh, then they said, so which format we should use? I said, you should use ODF, but don't take my word for granted. Make a test. Take two group of people, and for six months, because six months are nothing in terms of timing for 100,000 people, for six months, do a test. So after two months, they send us a document we, we are going to standardize on ODF. And I said, but it wasn't supposed to be six months. And I said, OK, if the next four months are like the first two, the decision would be even stronger. But the first two, the problem is one problem with, o with ODF documents and over 2,000 with uh, the uh, Microsoft formats. So it's not really, you know, a, a, it's not a decision, it's a no-brainer. You exchange documents, you know, we have discovered that you can exchange software uh, documents without any issue is a new situation for us and then of course we 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 told them and please understand that if you become a good citizen of the community you help us to grow the ecosystem so you just by telling to others that you are using libreoffice you educate enterprise about professional support. We have developed a certification program. Do you want your trainers to be certified? We are happy. Of course, they have to show that they uh, are respect our prerequisites. <coughs> and then uh, we provide professional support. I think that given the numbers, you might be interested in uh, getting professional support. 
And after, you know, after, at first they said, okay, why we should spend money? That's free software. Uh, but then after six months they said, okay, you were talking about professional support. What does it mean? I said, I'm not selling anything, so I just give you names of people that can provide the professional support. So now they are using the LTS version of a company that belongs to e the ecosystem. And I told them, it's probably useless that you use the LTS for 100,000 people. Make an assessment. See how many people are doing real strategic mm, job. And for those people, get the LTS. For the others, the vanilla version is OK. For the people that produce three documents per month, uh, why you should have a paying version. This is free software. So you have the beauty of choosing who can use the, let's say, let's call it professional LibreOffice. It's professional even the vanilla, but baked by professional support and the, the non-baked by professional support, where if you have an issue, you can find a workaround and no, if that is not impacting on your uh, productivity. And we have created in, in a training, you see this is our migration protocol. You see the training is here, uh, but it's key for us, uh, to un for people to understand, and we are doing it regularly with large organization, to understand that in the training, uh, a prerequisite, if they want our help, a prerequisite is that they listen either to me or to others for probably at least a couple of hours about the values of free software. And we have seen that if this happens, the resistance to change goes down. So after the four hours with the people, they, were, they told me, okay, so now we look at free software in a completely different way because we understand that it, free software is an industry. It's not just you know, the, the hobby of a few ponytail guys uh, uh, staying in basement or uh, uh, during at night, especially because I'm I don't have a ponytail. I'm over 60. Uh, I don't look like a hobbyist guy. So that's uh, and and of course we invite them to uh, apply for certification. And that's all. I don't know if I, there is time for questions. If there is, I'm happy to answer them. So can you remind us what were the main arguments uh, to help for the military, uh, the defense uh, organization in, uh, in Italy to s consider switching from... Uh oh, was price. So it's the, the, the answer is easy. <laughs> they, look at, they look at the price. And this is what everyone is doing. The problem is that they look at the price in the wrong way. They look at the price because there is not a price associated with the license, which is the only thing that they understand. Have you seen the rate of people switching uh, you know, continue to grow and accelerate? Is it flattening off? Is it going down? Uh, I would say it really depends uh, on uh, the, how much the local community is active and pushing. So um, where the local community is, is active, we see a growing number of migrations. Where the local community is not moving, we don't see migration going up. Uh, there, there are many hidden migrations, and there are uh, many hidden migration where then we are called uh, uh, as the fire brigade. Uh, because the uh, resistance to change explodes. So then we, we go there to, to do the firemen's usually. Yeah, uh, I work in a municipality where I like daily, either me or someone else has issues with the Microsoft Office suite. And I've been trying to talk to the IT department and the economical department, etc. cetera. Uh, but I'm thinking, are there like, EU directives or whatever that we can easily use to uh, persuade uh, <laughs> governments and municipalities, et cetera, to 
to essentially, well, switch over. Um, you know how many lobbies there are in Brussels? Okay, that, that's the city with the highest lobbyist, um, uh, num number of lobbyists uh, uh, in, in the world. There are three official lobbyists for each member of the parliament. And uh, uh, only due for the uh, copyright di directive, uh, people have burned in Brussels almost one billion dollar. And uh, this has, n let's say, this has not been used only to print documents, okay? <laughs> <laughs> or to print documents, but they were not the document that we think. You know, not white papers or uh, others. It's unfortunately, there is a di directive, is totally ignored. And one of the biggest issues is that the Microsoft Office format is, has been approved as a standard by ISO. And that, by, according to bribes, that is really official. I mean, it's otherwise, uh, it wouldn't have been approved in any case. It's so full of problems that looking, showing the, the, the format to a, an expert on standards, which is a species that doesn't exist on Earth, but if they exist, they understand after five minutes that it's not a standard. Thank you again for the presentation.